afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world, you have reached Science Saturday Chats, or as we really call it, Saturday Science Chats, if I could read things, right? Yes, I'm, you're, I am coming to you from Boca Raton, Florida. Yeah, the retirement capital of the world. Of course, every time you see a commercial or, or a movie, there's even the Sopranos, the TV series. They had a whole series called Boca. It's where everybody goes to retire. And yes, we do have mafia people here. I don't know of any of them, but um, they do exist. But uh, it's a great place. Really green. I really like it. And uh, but you have you have reached Saturday Science Chats, which we have every Saturday when we can. We'll have some days off like we did last week. And of course, today's big topic is is relativity relevant. Uh, we have lots and lots of people in our group, in our organization, talk about it, dispute it, uh, make arguments against it. Believe it or not, uh, during the last 30 years of being involved with this organization, there are actually people who defend it. But regardless, the question is, is this relevant anymore? That's today's topic. Um, I do want to sh make a shout out to my dad who's in the hospital right now. He had fallen down. You can see um, he knocked his noggin. Um, he seems to be, he's totally lucid and okay. In fact, you can see our book there. We're working on it. We have 10 people who've been reading it and we we're getting comments back, lots of comments um, using online, which is really great today. And uh, they are giving us super great feedback and uh, it's coming along quite well. And I actually took a laptop and the in the book and pencils and all that kind of stuff and paper to my dad, who's right where you see him sitting. He'll be working at it. Of course, the nurse came in and the people came in when he got in the hospital and says, uh, I must ask you this. Are you uh, being abused at home? <laughs> and I told my dad, just tell him this. Um, he is being forced to write a physics book with his with his son. So there you go. <laughs> Anyways, we all wish him the best. I don't think he's watching it right now because uh, Wi-Fi isn't so great there. And uh, we do wish him a speedy recovery. He's going to be in for a few days. Uh, so we hope, we don't know. So uh, let him free, they will let him free. So um, I want to again thank everyone for watching because it's your support that keeps us going. Uh, everybody's views. We are broadcasting live to Dissident Science, uh, and we are also broadcasting live to John Chappelle Natural Philosophy Society, both on the YouTube channel and on Facebook. And it is gets us a lot of views about our work, and I do appreciate. So if you're watching this, uh, the recording, make sure you click on the like and you subscribe, click on the little bell, and you'll be alerted when our next live session starts, which is really great. I always see that myself because I'm subscribed. And as soon as I hit that broadcast button, I see that pop up. And that's a really great way to be reminded. So if you like this show and you say, oh, I don't remember, subscribe to the YouTube channel. You don't have to watch it on YouTube or, or Facebook. Uh, you can watch, watch it on the other, but subscribe to it everywhere you can because then you will be alerted. I get alerted on my phone, my, my Apple Watch. Uh, etc. So uh, works out really well. But I do want to thank everybody. Oh, yeah, I got a new haircut. I said, that's it. I'm tired of coloring my hair. So 
natural gray at 61 here. We are critical where the critical thinkers meet. And again, we, I like to go over this every time because we have new viewers every time. We are the John Chappelle Natural Philosophy Society, named after John Chappelle, who started the NPA, Natural Philosophy Alliance, back in the early 90s, where they started out, guess what, disputing special relativity, especially. And that's how it sort of started. And now we have branched out to uh, give equal criticism to all parts of science. So um, we do uh, uh, support an open forum and study and debate and presentation of serious scientific ideas, theories, philosophies, and experiments not commonly accepted in mainstream science. That's why we exist. And this channel and this live show, there is nothing like it on YouTube. Um, I know everybody says that, and it's usually not true, but it's true. I mean, how many people are going to go out there and criticize mainstream science. Well, we do, because if you take a look, if you take the time to look, you'll find very quickly that things don't look so great. Everything you've been told may not be what it seems. Oh, we are an organization above all that does promote critical thinking without malice uh, to be an organization that supports positive vote, scientific work outside, you know, and to provide a forum for debate on modern topics in physics, cosmology, philosophy, and mathematics. Uh, to provide, provide a form for presenting serious and papers and theories without fear of censorship and run by our members. They can get rid of me if they don't like me. Hey, then I can uh, uh, kick back and retire. Nah, that'll never happen. Uh, who we are, we are open to challenging mainstream science. We allow and encourage competing ideas or models. Yes, we are allowing that, and we do encourage that. That is, we have people with competing ideas. Imagine that. Uh, imagine trying to put push any part of humankind's knowledge forward by allowing competing ideas. There's only one universe and there's only one. No, 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 not true. We are in scientific revolution. I'm um, scientific. We are in model revolution right now. In fact, if you want to see it, go to Dissident Science Model Revolution and click on that. You can also read on it on our new on our website, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit. Um, we do follow the scientific method because, oh, my gosh. How many people, oh, those people throw everything out and they do not follow the scientific method? That could be not further from the truth. Uh, who doesn't follow the scientific method? Is, you know, places like the linear, uh, uh, what is the Large Hadron Collider? Uh, and uh, if you don't believe that, read the book uh, Higgs Fake by our friend and a uh, and, uh, person who appears here, Dr. Alexander Unsker, physicist and science journalist. Um, we can also consider an idea without accepting that. That's my favorite thing. When somebody sends me a new book because of uh, I've been doing um, sort of market, not marketing, but getting the word out there, I get people's, people send me books right out of the blue, and I love it. If it's a totally new idea of how the universe works, I just jump into that, and I think that's just the greatest because I enjoy that. I think, you know, opens your mind up, and it's not like, oh, I know these people are wrong, and my dad and I's model's right. No, it's not that at all. Somebody could send me the book that, is the next thing in science. And that's why it's always amazing and why we all should consider it ideas because people spend a lot of time on these things and there's always something amazing that comes out of them. They've seen something about the universe you haven't, and that's important. So we give voice to the voiceless, of course, and uh, this is where science advances. So you're gonna find the Copernicuses, the Galileos, the um, Newtons, the um, Paulies, the, uh, Borkerts you'll find, and Deneuze, and other people, uh, Jeff Yees, all the people here today working on amazing stuff. And again, if you haven't checked, checked out our, check out our channel, subscribe to it, go back and watch some of our interviews with some of these amazing people. You notice I didn't say Einstein in there. Oh, no. Okay, who we are not, we're not a specific point of view. We don't talk about one thing. Some uh, organizations, even outside the mainstream, are bent in different directions. For instance, like the electric universe, they're much more interested in looking at the electric universe. It's not wrong. It's just different. Um, and I, I encourage you to take a look at their work too. Uh, they do fantastic work. Um, and if you uh, are interested in finding out more about them, you can look them up. They got quite a big organization. Uh, general science, we're not a general science organization. Organization, You won't see us uh, doing videos on calculating the trajectory of a baseball coming out of a cannon. Uh, 
we are not a new age kind of group. Uh, we're not a conspiracy or UFO group because we are not into that because we have so many things to dispute already, including fundamental science like gravity uh, fields, magnetic magnetism, tectonics, math, philosophy, big bang, cosmology. Uh, let's work on those first maybe before we worry about whether aliens live among us. Um, our websites, and I will be showing that to you in a, in a second. <clears throat> we have rebranded our so what used to be science woke because people hijacked a actually perfectly good word. Well, you know, the word retarded. I have a master's in linguistics and we study this quite a, a lot. And the, the problem is like um, they use the word retarded in the, I think the 1950s and it was meant to be, it was a very neutral word. Then what happened? People said it's still, they still want to make fun of people who have handicaps. So retarded then became a bad word. And then it, let's call them special because that's even better because it's even, and now when you're a kid and they say, well, you're special. Um, so if people hijack words all the time uh, that are perfectly good and uh, turn them for their, uh, turn them into bad use. And that's what happened, unfortunately, with woke. I think it's too, too bad. We also have our other f uh, website, the f uh, that's uh, naturalphilosophy.org. <clears throat> A critical thinking community. Uh, you can go on there, register, and, and join in discussions about all kinds of topics and not be afraid to say, hey, I think relativity is wrong. And of course, we do have our natural philosophy wiki um, and over 10,000 pages in that. And here is the rebranding. And of course, I had to come up with the logo. Who comes up with the logos? David does. So if you hate him, hate me. Um, don't hate the, I'm not the messenger. I'm actually the author. So you can hate me directly. Dave, that logo is terrible, but I guess you can sort of see if you can't figure that one out, then I can't help you out. But, um, I did, uh, run that by our people and people seem to like it a lot. And it's beyond mainstream is, is it's beyond mainstream.org. Um, I didn't think we needed science. I did try beyond mainstream.com. Anybody take a guess in the chat, how much be, uh, beyondmainstream.com is going for on the market. So chatters, get out there. I'll leave that go. I'm watching the chat. So take a guess. Of course, people are Googling it right now on how much uh, beyond mainstream.org was like 13 bucks a year. So I bought for a couple of years for our organization with people's help, of course, and their subscriptions. So let's take a look at, um, I'm going to go to this beyond. Uh, there we go. And I'm going to bring it over here. Here we go. You should be seeing that. And yes, I see you do. <clears throat> so you can see it's been rebranded up here. Um, we don't, we uh, get woke used to say now it says three, think critically, big problem. So I've tried to re replace it and I will guarantee, I will guarantee you can send me emails and everything else that I have woke other places in this, um, on this website. So I am one person. I've tried to get rid of it as much as I can. If you go to the about now, we've changed it a little bit. You can see there's no science woke mention, no woke at all. It used to see uh, science woke here. It now says wide eyed, meaning eyes open. Uh, so it's all there. You can check everything out, including problems in science. Oh, relativity. There's problems. Okay. Yep. There they are. But again, it's rebranded. Re um, even a lot of these things in the beginning, they start here. Um, uh, these, you can notice I've changed them from woke to wide eyed. So I've gone through the major articles that had woke in them and changed them. Uh, where do I get time? To this? <laughs> Anyways, that's uh, that. So check it out, folks. It's a great website. Um, we do have lots of people who read that. It's a great way to get yourself uh, into, oh my gosh, mainstream science has problems. Oh, come on. How could that be? What problems? Let me know. Go there. Not only you find the problems, you'll find articles about what problems there are that explain things about why there are problems. And you'll find scientists not only who criticize mainstream, but who have better solutions than mainstream by far. So um, another thing is you become, you can become a member of this whole thing that's happening because of you. Please, please, please consider becoming a, a monthly or annual member or make a donation. It's greatly, greatly appreciated and needed. Um, when the money runs out, this stops. I am not, I don't, I wish I was 
uh, independently wealthy and I could support all this, but I'm not. And I certainly can only get out here and make a pitch and give every, everybody as much content and, and places and things that will allow us critical thinkers to meet and do and to function. We really do need support all the time. Um, our bank account is okay, but it certainly could use more people supporting us monthly and annually. Five bucks a month, the numbers of people are doing that. Other people are annual memberships and I do uh, thank those people who have given donations once in a while. So if you can pop some money away our way, it's all, all use. Um, um, I pay to do this job actually. <laughs> That is, I do my, it's not just my time, but, you know, I, I like other people have put in my time and money into this. So this is a labor of love in the sense of love of science and critical thinking. Again, I want to thank our patrons, Dr. Cynthia Whitney, Nick Percival, Duncan Shaw, Mr. Anonymous, um, my father, uh, Get Well Soon, and Kurt Renshaw, and other people. Um, we do have CMPS 2021 on uh uh, coming along, we are we are receiving papers. So I know Jeff Yee is uh, going to be presenting. Uh, my father and I have uh, each papers. We have other people who have been sending our papers. We will uh, official launch. I keep moving that. It's April and May and June. I was supposed to do it this weekend, but with my father, uh, I have to go visit him. We're in the hospital right after this. So um, please excuse me for not having that page. It's going to be only a, really a page there, but you do you can send an email to proceedings at naturalphilosophy.org. If you've never published a paper and you even have an idea and you want help, we will help you. We use the publishing system called Overleaf, and so it all comes out nice, and it comes out in a nice book, and we put the book on Amazon. It's available, so you will be a published author. Uh, we do need volunteers, so if you do want to volunteer, uh, contact me at the same email, proceedings uh, at naturalphilosophy.org. Um, CMP, CMPS publishing, um, the uh, Notfinity is being published. <clears throat> I know its final draft has been approved. George is, is looking into getting that published uh, online uh, very soon. Um, uh, the Ether book by Ramsey, which is a pen name, that is done and uh, actually received a, a book. So it is published. We're gonna, as soon as we get the information, we'll let people know. Um, any any uh, Proceeds from that book will be going to Argo organization, as according to um, the shadow author of that book, um, who I know personally for many years. And so <clears throat> I can say it's a he that he um, uh, is doing that, which I thought was very kind. And we are in a final version. We have 10 people reviewing it. We use Dropbox and Dropbox allows us to put a PDF of the whole book there and people can comment on that. It's so great today in age. And so people are sending in all our, all the comments. My father and I are going through them saying, uh, correcting spellings and things that aren't well understood and uh, suggestions and all that. And uh, it's going to be, uh, I think we're going to get to, to our final book this 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 month. And then hopefully in July, uh, we'll have uh, printing uh, our final version on the, on Amazon and uh, around the world. Um, and you, so if you're outside the country, you can buy it. And then also um, we will be having a virtual book signing because, um, well, mostly friends and family. So we're not you know, out there thinking the world's going to come knocking out our door. It's just something my father and I worked on for six years and we're very proud of it. Um, and uh, just like any of the authors here. So it's just another ver view of the universe. Uh, play coming attractions. Okay, I will do that. Hey, what was those last people in there? Yep, yep, we'll be presenting. I had talked uh, with some of the people. Oh, I've got slides on these people. So before I do that, yes, I am talking with Steve Bryan. He's actually looking uh, maybe to be accepted his book into a publisher or some something like that. And so he's waiting for that. That's why he's been delaying. But um, he's really excited about coming on. In fact, I do see him in the chat once in a while. So if you're out there in the chat, um, hello, uh, uh, Stephen. Uh, wonderful communicator, wonderful thinker, love the guy's work, 
great, great, great. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to that. I think you guys will really enjoy it too. It's going to be a great conversation. Oh, yeah, the demise of relativity. Huh. Wonder what his opinion is. Uh, <laughs> actually, that was a article written about his book. I think by Glenn Borker. And um, we have uh, Phil Borker coming along, not related to Glenn Borker. And of course, uh, Dr. Alexander Unsker, The Higgs Fake. Read it, read it, and read it. The Higgs Fake. Read it. Um, I suggest you read The Higgs Fake. So if you like anything about physics and you follow particle physics at all, <clears throat> and you want to know what's really happening, read The Higgs Fake. Do you think people are out there in universities telling you to read The Higgs Fake? No. Not at all. You will be uh, abhorred by the way uh, they complete uh, the scientific method and the engineering and software techniques they use. Oh my gosh. Um, and yes, we will be talking about our book coming up. Got to change it. My chair, my hair, it's different. Oh, play, it to, to play today's bumper. Here we go. Make sure I click on the right thing here. Today is relativity relevant. I thought that was so good. I, at first I made the title is relativity irrelevant. And I thought, no, let's make it. Is it relevant? Why? Because there are a lot of people, especially in our organization, who spend an incredible amount of time working on uh, showing Einstein and relativity wrong. So I figured that is a better title. I love this graphic. It's from a graphic, our, our, our website now, Beyond Mainstream Science. Uh, dot org may be on mainstream dot org and uh, these people pulling over Einstein's bust in the middle of I think that's the Palladium um, in uh, Italy there's Rome I'm she I'm an architect I should know that one of the greatest buildings of all time of course especially for its ep epoch and uh, are we pulling him down that's the idea but let's take a look at it I've got some slides I'm gonna be talking about Einstein for a little bit. Um, given that I'm somewhat of a specialist in that area, I guess, because I spent eight years making a documentary on it, and um, I'm not the only specialist in it. There are people who've been disputing Ein time for way longer, but I have more of a higher level view, I think, of it. So I hope you enjoy some of my uh, take on this, sort of riffing, as they say today, riffing on relativity. Riff. Yeah, there you go. And if I put that, half the uh, people in the CMPS wouldn't show up like, What's David doing? Uh, but I keep up with, you know, I'm 61, but I've got a modern mind. Here we go. Uh, Einstein's relativity. Now, this is not my statement. This is a statement by Glenn Borkert, and I agree with him 100%. And that is, Einstein's relativity is the most disputed theory in physics. There's not anything, anything that even comes close. Now, think about it. Okay, those out you out there who like maybe think Einstein's great and his work is great because you've been told that. Well, why would there be almost five thousand books, papers, and videos showing Einstein wrong? Some of the greatest minds out there. Um, something must be up. Okay, if you have a few people dissenting, that's one thing. But if you got thousands and thousands of published. Uh, books and papers and videos and and uh, white papers about how relativity is wrong. Something must be up. We should take a look at it. And so that's what I what she said, suggest you do. And hopefully this talk today will help you um, point you in the right direction and give you some information. The other thing that's really interesting is when I made my documentary, Einstein Wrong, I had my mom sit in, in my dad's office uh, um, and uh, turn on, my, on the camera for my documentary and start calling uh, universities around the country. So I gave her a list of 50 universities to call. Uh, she didn't make it all the way through. <laughs> I'll tell you the story about that. But um, anyways, she was calling all the universities and the idea was to find somebody who'd be willing on phone to come on and talk about um, relativity and defend it. And what she found out was no one majors in it. Everyone she called says, well, 
professor so-and-so sort of like you know pays attention to it but there was not anybody that who made a living off, uh, off of it or who would claim to be uh, uh, a relativity expert now the only one i know is kip thorne from caltech and um, he got his nobel prize with the gravity waves a couple of years ago because it was just more of a hats off to him because he's been around so darn long i guess he's what 170 17 years old now just joking he's pretty old and so it was more of just he was literally put on there because um people decided that his work in relativity and gravity waves and that should be put together so he was literally uh, along for the ride and then um, i'm sure they consulted him and i'm sure they justified it but he's the only person i know that supposedly lives today that would be majoring in relativity um most of it's the so why is this weird well it's the most important theory in physics they say you hear it over and over it rules the universe at least it does for now newton did but now rel rel relativity and einstein do general and, and special relativity and yet no one really studies it or uses it and yeah the bending of light for planet detection um uh, they have that, but other explanations have been given, like Dr. Dowdy, he would tell you, yeah, light's bending around these things, but it isn't gravity that's doing it. So that's um, that's what um, uh, he says. So yeah, everyone studies it, no one uses it. And of course, this is, this is from our uh, database. Um, is this a pointer? I think it is. There we go. Sorry. There's my pointer. I should have had that out. But this is from the database technical papers and abstracts. This is not the year. This is the number of catalog things we have that are marked with relativity and Einstein. And very, very few, maybe two or three. I, I don't quote me on any of this, but I believe there are some sort of positive, but most all those are negative. That's just in our database, folks. So Einstein's relativity. No one majors in it. No one gets a degree in it. I forgot to put that down. Well, that's what it is. No one majors in relativity. That's a degree. And uh, that's very strange for the most important theory in physics. So um, let's keep going forward. Hello. There we go. Now let's talk about um, GPS and relativity. Um, Ron Hatch, who recently passed away. Um, hats off to him. Again, it's just really hard for me to believe these people are gone. Um, he uh, basically was um, a person who made a, a very good living at uh, GPS. I can probably say he was close to a millionaire if he was not a millionaire. He started a company in GPS which was bought by um, Deer Tractors. It's a, I can't remember the name. I think it's Navcom or something. Or don't quote me on any of these names. It's been a while. Um, in my movie, you can go see it. So watch my movie. You, we go and visit him in his office. But he was a holder of over 30 patents in GPS. Uh, his quote from my movie, I asked him, he said, I said, I want a one sentence quote from the movie about GPS and relativity. And he gave it to me, which appears in the movie, in big, bold letters on, the, on my chalkboard. And he says, GPS reveals the flaws in relativity. So, but of course, um, he, I asked him, well, when you do papers on this and you talk to other people in GPS, he is met with silence. They don't want to talk about it because they don't want to be the person to upset the apple cart, as Neil Adams says about mainstream science, the guy who makes those videos on expanding Earth. And he basically um, says, nope, um, it's not something anybody wants to talk about. Although, another story, got lots of great stories, <clears throat> again, for those people who are new to this channel. We got a lot of new people. Again, thank you for so much. Remember, hit the like button, subscribe button. Um, we um, uh, we were, somebody was giving a talk. I don't know if it was Ron Hatch or I think it was maybe at the University of Maryland. We had quite a big conference, over 100 people for our conference. That's pretty, quite a lot. And someone was talking about GPS, maybe even Ron Hatch. And I'm going to say could be one of the two places doesn't matter where it was one of our conferences and um while the person was talking greg volk my uh, cohort and putting together the database that you see that we have both on our wiki uh and which has over what six thousand ten thousand inf pieces of information in our database about dissident scientists and their work um he was sitting in the audience and while ron hatch or somebody else was talking 
the guy literally leans over to him and says, you know, I'm in the GPS um, industry and we don't you. And he literally whispers, he says, this is a, a, a dirty little secret. We don't use GPS. I'm, <laughs> we don't re reuse relativity in GPS. And well, why do they um, uh, why do they go and let people say it? Well, because Ron Hatch made a lot of money off of it. Uh, the company that that hired him and had him on until I think his death, um, he uh, makes a ton of money off of it. Why? Because the more accurate your GPS is, the more lucrative you will be. You will be able to make your corn fields. The tractors go over corn fields within a centimeter, centimeters. You can uh, multiply that across the country and you save millions and millions of dollars. So they're not going to show their algorithms to us to show that, oh, yeah, look here. Um, here's our algorithm. Um, go start your own company, make millions of dollars. No, they're not going to do it. So it's uh, unfortunately a catch 22. And um, so we don't get to see them. But um, as you can see here, here I am, this is a couple of years ago, actually, I met Bill Nye, the science guy, who wouldn't let me take this picture. I literally got this picture from them. He is so market oriented uh, that um, we were not allowed to take out our phones and take a picture of him with, with, my, with me. I couldn't hand my phone to somebody to have him take a picture. They had to be official. I mean, this guy is really interested. Can't you feel he is most more interested in scientific truth than he is in publicity or making a living or ego or power, whatever it is. But I call him a science evangelist. And uh, he stood up there and I was in the first um, row. Um, I, I, I had to be nice because I was there not on my own accord. I was actually um, doing some work with the uh, robotics department there on, on behalf of my our company. And um, he he holds out his cell phone and he goes, here it is. Here it is. This cell phone in your pocket. It will not. It's GPS will not work um, if it wasn't for special and general relativity. And I bit my tongue. And here he is standing in front of these young, impressionable minds. And we keep repeating over and over that GPS uses relativity when it doesn't. And it's just, it's really sad. So it's one of the areas that are hard to deal with because we don't have um, the equations and we don't have the um, what's going on. Uh, given to us to be able to examine ourselves. We can't look at the raw data. Um, and one interesting note here is before Ron Hatch died, he was working on and talking with NASA about a 0.56 picosecond discrepancy between satellites. And his argument, at least he told me, he said he didn't have any proof of it. He was still trying to work on it, um, but he was working on that. And his suggestion was is that um, see the speed of light being sent from one um, um, from one satellite to another because none of them, as much as they say, are stationary. Uh, none of them are. They are moving. And so he said, if you take C plus V, um, you would get the a 0.5 picoseconds. Is because you're adding the um, the the speed of the uh, satellite to the speed of light. And then on the way back, um, it was subtracted. And of course, the way GPS pretends that they're not violating special relativity, that is, you can't go faster than speed of light, um, they say that, of course, it averages out to be C. So there you go. That's sort of what I know about the uh, GPS and relativity. It's going to be a mystery. It's going to be one of those things we'll never really know because no one's going to come along and talk about it. And yes, the other part is, well, we know relativity is right, general relativity is right, because clocks slow down in space. Well, clocks, including atomic clocks, are affected by gravity. Okay. What are, what are atomic clocks made out of? Real things. They're not made out of imaginary particles like particle physics wants you to think of, say, imagine. Uh, they're made by really mass, and that mass, even if they're atomic clocks, is mass, and that mass is affected by gravity. And yes, that's what GPS said. They said, yep, it's a mechanical clock. It's affected. So what they do is just empirical. They measure what's different. They can calculate, oh, yeah, it's off by this. Put a formula to it. Do they know what's happening? Do they have an explanation? No but it's not general relativity. All right, onward, onward. Oh, press a button. 
Another interesting story about relativity that shows relativity incorrect is Dr. Cynthia Whitney. She is the CMPS chief scientist. She's uh, in her 80s, uh, mid or late 80s now. She's not doing too well. Um, I, I, I've asked her to come on, but she just doesn't feel right about that. A couple of years ago, three or four years ago, we were at her home when we were near, uh, had our conference in Vancouver, um, Canada. And, oh, no. No, sorry. We were in Seattle, Washington at the University of Washington. Oh, sorry. We've been around, around a lot of places here. And um, she, um, we did get to see her and talk with her and sit in her, her home. And she was lucid at that time, but she, you know, she prefers to lay low these days. She is the editor of Electro Galilean Electrodynamics. Galilean Electrodynamics. That doesn't, that sounds like, wait a minute, it sounds like Newton with, with Electrodynamics. What? But uh, she is, uh, uh, this is how, what happened. She got her PhD in special relativity from MIT. I've mentioned that many times before. And she applied the media after she got her uh, um, degree. She uh, was assigned to apply to special relativity to ring gyroscopes and it failed. Now you're gonna ask, oh my gosh, that must have been really important. It was MIT, so she must go to her professors. The professors go running around. Um, oh my gosh, we've made a giant discovery. Einstein's theory doesn't work. Um, we need to investigate this because whenever you have something doesn't work, we need to adjust our theories or throw out the old one, come up with a new one. So she went to her professor and she was like, really at that time, that's not what she was thinking. She was thinking like, okay, what are we doing wrong? What am I doing wrong? And the professor says, you're not doing anything wrong. Yeah, we know it doesn't work. <laughs> I mean, folks. And then what happened? Did the all of MIT start gathering around that and telling the world how amazing it was to find this this uh, application of a perfectly legitimate application of special relativity because it deals with light and light speed around a ring and special relativity just falls apart. This is big news. So we all know that in the uh, early seven, late 60s, early, I think it was the early 70s, that special relativity was disproven and shown to be not a good theory by the uh, Dr. Uh, Cynthia Whitney and MIT, and she got a Nobel. No, you know, should that have happened? Yeah, you know, Nobel Prize. Who cares? Nobel. Unfortunately, Nobel prizes and to me is not worth the paper it's printed on, because it's all a popularity contest, and you have things like this going on, they don't pay attention to it. So uh, no, that didn't happen. And what was the response of the professor? She told me, Yeah, we know. Well, what do we do about it? Well, that's just the way it is. Meaning. Shut your mouth, uh, keep teaching it, get your paycheck, go home, and be happy that you are uh, continuing to push a theory that has an immense amount of problems that should probably be abandoned. But um, good news is, if you want the entire story, I did have her write her uh, account down, uh, not as uh, detailed as maybe you would uh, I would have liked, but it's definitely worth reading. If it's worth reading, because it's the number one. Pay, um, uh, article on our new beyond mainstream.org website. So take a look at that. So that's another extremely interesting story. And where is she? She's now the chief uh, scientist for an organization who openly says to the world relativity is wrong for more than just too many reasons, not even worth it to try to get into them all. Um, another person that you may uh, uh, know or not know of is Dr. Ricardo Carazzani. He's the reason I'm sitting here today. He's the reason my dad and I came up with even a model we have. Um, and um, I met him in the early 1990s. He came into my wife's uh, clothing store. She was making clothes at the time, sort of a little shop in Long Beach, California. His son-in-law came in, saw the art, said, oh, you're, who's that? And my wife said, oh, my he's a my husband is an artist uh oh so he's an artist that's nice no he's also a scientist and uh he thought oh a big thinker maybe i can get my uh, father-in-law over here to talk to uh him because he's got he's got some work that he wants to get somebody to help get the word out so that was my first foray into it and then literally a day later or the same day i was in the store with my wife I was living in an art, artist loft at the time. I was working in artificial intelligence for my day job and doing art at night. And we had the guy 
this guy come in, really skinny guy, and um, uh, he came with this bunch of papers, like a stack of papers. I mean, it was like that, and plopped them on the desk and proceeded to say, tell me that he had shown Einstein um, wrong and by age 20, he, said he found several flaws in special relativity. He developed these new autodynamic equations. Um, uh, after about three years of looking at his work, it was true he could only talk in mathematics. So anytime he talked with anybody who didn't know science or mathematics, people were lost. So I, I ended up understanding what he had found was that there was only one three-dimensional space and that one that uh, more than one mathematical or physical frame in the universe is totally redundant when that happens you've got to throw away special relativity and if you look at the equations they became they become newtonian very interesting uh, his work is stellar work he finds actually problems the same kind of problem that um uh, jack uh, kirkendall found um with the the consistency of the physical meaning of special relativity the equations and they just fall apart because of the velocities that they try to put together um, are not the same velocities you can't put them together they end up being v squared karazani found the exact same thing in a different way which is quite remarkable and um, he also finds a two-thirds problem in our book coming up because uh, we were very, we were inspired by it. There is an appendix, and in the appendix, we publish, republish his work. Um, another story about R R Ricardo R Carazzani, a bunch of stories. Uh, he actually convinced um, uh, the Stan people at the Stanford Linear Accelerator, which later I, I revisited in my movie. He got them to do an experiment to show special relativity uh, or autodynamics correct. Um, so he did that. He did succeed in doing that experiment. And lo and behold, it did not show that. Um, so at that point, they all just looked at him and said, go away, little boy or uh, crazy man. You're, you've been disproven. Well, of course, when if, as all of us know, all of us know your first uh, experiment is always a lot of times has flaws. And he went and he looked back at his experiment and he says, OK, this was wrong. Um, he wasn't tweaking it to make the data change. It was not. It was not done correctly, and so he went back to uh, the Stanford Linear Accelerator. I think he caught. He talked with. Gosh darn it, Noyes. Oh no, he did the 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 experiment with Noyes, but um, it's a it's a Hispanic name. A guy who won the Nobel Prize, and he talked with the Nobel Prize winner, and the Nobel Prize winner came back to him and says, "You may be right, Dr. Carazzani, but I'm too old to, to fight anymore." So anyways, that was that was an interesting story. <clears throat> um, another interesting story about this is I um, and again, it is worth t telling because these are all proof that there are problems with relativity. Um, I was working at Space Park in the AI department um, in Redondo Beach, California. And when I uh, met Karazani, that's where I happened to be working at the time. And I knew that they had physicists there. And those physicists, well, because uh, Space Park there, they developed the lunar lander, um, uh, the engine for the lunar lander. So I decided to write the president of TRW. Um, no, they are an engineering group, but I think they also, they also do information. People talk about um, your credit score with TRW. But anyways, um, I was working there, and so I wrote the president, President Gorman. I mean, I just had the, I said, look, I have an experiment you can do. And this was Karazani's new experiment, new radium E experiment that you could do and it, um, that could win a Nobel Prize. And three weeks, I didn't hear anything. For three weeks later, I find a, I get a email or phone call. Uh, I, I don't remember which. And it says, meet um meet me and some other colleagues in a room at this day and time so i i put together all the stuff i could from Riccarazzani's work all his papers all his, his his description of the um new radium e experiment to show uh, special relativity wrong and he uh i walked into a room and it was just really i'll never forget it all my life uh, the rest of my life basically a room of physicists sitting there and they were um all looking at me like I walked in, like I was, you know, one of those movies from NASA where, you know, Paul 13's going awry and we got to fix it. So all eyes were on me and they were sitting there and um, they then repeated what I was talking about 
um, like uh, you had an experiment that could win a Nobel Prize. And, uh, and then I then I uh, then I got fear put into me. He goes, well, this is so and so and this is so and this. And these three people are retired physicists, but they came out, they came out of retirement to come here to, to listen to what you're going to say. And I'm thinking, well, so I'm talking and I'm talking, I'm talking, I'm talking about um, what the experiment was, uh, radium E, you put it in a, uh, and you measure the energy coming out um, and explain it to him. He says, well, what are the um, consequences of this experiment? I said, well, one of them is it's going to show the neutrino doesn't exist. So another guy turned, turned to another guy, he says, wait a minute, he turned to his friend. He says, didn't the SN 1987, supernova 1987A show that neutrinos existed? And I go, yeah, I think I read something about it. And, I, and so I, you know what? <laughs> So I turned to the, these physicists that I, like me, uh, AI engineer, software guy. Uh, I go, um, you know, uh, were, are you an expert in neutrinos? Is, are you a particle physicist? No, no. I said, well, then how do you know the neutrino exists? Well, all my colleagues tell me. I said, well, how do you know your colleagues are right? He goes, oh, I trust my colleagues. Oh, boy. You right away, right away, you knew something was going on. But um, what happened was after I explained, after I stood there for 10, 15, 20 minutes, eh, maybe 15, um, and explained this and even had some decent arguments and I even handed them stuff about the neutrino because I was prepared. And um, they go, oh, so you're a physicist? <laughs> Here it comes. No, they looked around and I literally got laughs. I got laughs like I was the janitor or something like that, right? And basically they said, go, go away, um, thank you, get out of here, go away. And they started looking at it, right? So they're looking at it and I don't have any idea what happened in the room at the time. And it turns out that I figured, okay, that's the end of that, they're not gonna do it. Um, you know, I did tell them that special relativity would be shown wrong. They didn't seem to mind that too much. The truth of the matter is, folks, this is out of my mouth and out of the mouths of other people I know who know physics inside and out and real physicists in the real world in physics. Um, the theoretical physics in the physics community itself isn't that well respected. It gets all the it, it sucks up all the air out of the room for physics. But people aren't so they're not so shocked by the idea that relativity is wrong. So they weren't that shocked by it. So anyways, um, if you if you go forward three weeks, I figure nothing's going to happen. And then I get a letter, not an email, a letter on company letterhead. I mean, super official. Um, I still think I have, well, I think I had, I have it. I'm supposed to have it somewhere. So I kept that letter and um, I thought I, well, I may have lost it, but anyways, in the letter, it basically stated um, there was one person, he said, I was assigned to look at this and the person's the thing that shocked me, what happened was in 1994, I believe it was, I had met Carazon only a couple of years earlier, maybe even less than that. Um, I wasn't totally committed to this. I was, it wasn't that I was thinking it was crazy, but I'm thinking, well, you know, maybe his work isn't right. Maybe there's something's wrong, whatever. And it turns out that I was reading the letter and that's why I'm sitting here today because this letter changed everything. Because I was reading along, and they said, you know, um, so the sentence that hit me was, and from my studying it, I cannot find anything wrong in Ricardo's, uh, Dr. Carazani's mathematics. And that hit me like a ton of bricks. I thought to myself, if these guys, in other words, they, and I think they even said something like, you know, this could be legitimate. And, and I thought to myself, oh my gosh, they're going to do this experiment. And of course, then the next paragraph hits and that is <laughs> 10 foot pole comes along and it says, well, as you know, this involves radiation and we don't uh, do any, we, we don't have the facilities to do any uh, experiments with radiation lie. They work with the frickin uh, lunar lander. What do you think one of the biggest concerns they had for everything, electronics and everything? Radiation. Lie. So they lied about that. Um, uh, and the second thing they uh, said was, 
we do not do research or experiments for just pure science. Uh, we have to have a business justification. So there you go. There's a really interesting story about a person, a man and his, his, uh, his work. He inspired us, uh, me to continue in this. I took his work to then the NPA in 1996, met John Chappelle, met a lot of other people. And from that, then I you know, got into this world. Uh, eventually in 2005, many, many years later, I decided uh, that because of the miracle year of, of Einstein that I would uh, 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 do a documentary. And that's what I did. I'll talk a little bit about that. Interesting enough, um, uh, autodynamic equations, when you look at it, basically they turn the special relativity equations into a, an equation of a rocket ship. It says, if you want to have any movement, if you are a self-contained mass in the universe and you want to move, the only way you're going to move as a self-contained mass is to expel mass. And that's what his uh, equations did. And with those equations, you can rewrite and explain and derive Bohr's atom, at, uh, atom the equations for Bohr's atom without wave equations. Hmm, that's uh, a chalk one up for particle models versus uh, wave models. So that was very interesting. Um, he also can describe nuclear and nuclear collisions without uh, neutrinos. Neutrinos don't exist, folks. Study the neutrino, study where it comes from. You will not find where it really comes from because they have to sort of hide the origin of the neutrino. Don't get me on. Maybe I'll just do a whole show on the neutrino. It's just like the bad boy of, of particle physics. Alrighty, let's keep going. Uh, Steve Bryant wrote a book called Disruptive, uh, 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 Disruptive, Rewriting the Rules of Physics. What does he take down? Relativity. Um, if you want to get his book, read it. It's a great, great, great book. Uh, very well put together. He's right now trying to get his book out there um, in a real publisher, but uh, really wonderful man. Uh, like I said, brilliant mind. I'm not going to talk too much about it because we'll be talking about that. You've got to have some type of marketing. Come back here. All right. Um, let me put one of these banners up here. There we go. Um, and let's see what else we have here. Yes, then there is the film Einstein Wrong the Miracle Year. Um, I started in 2005 because it was the miracle year of Einstein who came up with um, special theory of relativity. Um, um, I don't know, it was a Brownian motion. I don't remember. And um, uh, photoelectric effect. Don't quote me on any of those because I, again, I'm not, I don't study those things. The photoelectric effect, yeah, uh, we, I look at. But basically it was, it was his miracle year of all the things he came up with in 2005. To, in 1905, in 2005, there were just people, everybody who knew anything about Einstein was on TV and then they made a big thing about it. And there was a, um, a big, um, 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 in the uh, Jewish Museum, the Skirball Museum, which is a, um, I guess it's a museum, funded and it's uh, Jewish, uh, have people who are in the Jewish uh, faith who, who uh, and culture who uh, made that museum. They, of course, uh, uh, Einstein was Jewish, so they had a big um, um, retrospective on him and a science kind of display. We went that, I went to that with Karazani. Oh, that's a funny story. Um, and uh, basically uh, I filmed uh, it took over eight years. Um, I got funding from the MPA members back before there was anything like Patreon or anything on the internet. I literally did it with letters and addresses and stamps and uh, books. I even put together books to send pr uh, prospective investors. It cost about uh, $150,000 to make. A lot of funding came from other people, but I put a lot of my money into it. Um, a lot of my money into it as well. And I'm not a person with a lot of money, but um, I did film it between 2005 and 2013, taking my mother along. The idea of the film was pretty simple. Take a suburban house life along and meet all these people who are working outside of mainstream um, and then try to meet some people in mainstream. And um, uh, that's how this film came about. Uh, she, I, I actually had a filmed me asking my mom in 2004 if she would do this and go on my this journey uh i was in california and she was moving out with my dad to california from cal um from alabama to california and she said okay i'll do it and then i uh, started taking my mom around 
to meet people, including the person at Stanford Linux Accelerator, which I think I will talk about later. So I won't talk about that. But it was took eight years to make. Um, I did go to. Um, uh, I've, li I've loved film, uh, people who think, oh, I just started to make a film. No, I made my first films when I was 11 with an 8 millimeter camera, so I always wanted to go in film. Uh, I think I should have gone in film, but, you know, sometimes things don't go your way. Um, uh, and uh, so I decided, oh, yeah, I can make a film. So I made that. Uh, I premiered in 2013 in Long Beach, California. Uh, it was funded by MPM members. You can watch it online, EinsteinWrong.com. Uh, it costs three dollars to watch, ten dollars to buy. You can watch it as many times as you want. That's on Vimeo. The reason I don't change that is because the people who invested it, it's a way of being respectful. Um, I did send it to over eighty um, film festivals, um, and it was made the finals of a couple, but never made it in. I think the controversy behind it, people just wanted to look at it as a film that was you know crackpot kind of film the one that i came close to was really interesting was the oxford film festival and the oxford film festival i was actually in in uh email contact with the head of the film festival who really liked the film and was trying to get it in because uh they liked the film because they're all newton and no einstein a lot of people in, in england don't like einstein because he's like competition fa uh, in fame wise with with newton and so um, he told me, and then I made it literally to the final cuts, and I didn't make it in. He apologized. He said, you know, people are just too scared of it. So um, I did uh, come up with our own film festival with other films and stuff, and people voted on it, and it, you know, did well. But um, the audience loved it. Um, uh, the audience just we're totally blown away by it because it was a great story. For those who haven't seen it, it's not like this Dave D. Hilster guy, computer guy makes it. This uh, I had editors from from t television um, and Hollywood work with it. They're not very well known, but they know the business. Um, and I also had music, and I actually have a theme song for the music. Uh, and one of the biggest compliments we get uh, for the film is the movie music. In fact, if you watch the beginning of this, you'll hear um, The Miracle Year by Michael Ruggieri and um, his, um, his stepdaughter singing, uh, my friend's daughter, she uh, sang in it, and, and uh, he did all the composition and the music for, for it. And that's beautiful music, great theme song. It's a masterpiece, in my opinion, um, and I know I study music theory a lot, so really great. So you want to check that out. Um, whoops. Uh, Einstein Wrong Miracle Year. Here's what's in it for spoiler alerts, but it's definitely worth watching. It maybe get you interested in watching it. Um, the atomic clock experiment. These are the three things that I used at the time to show special relati uh, relativity wrong, special and general. And the first was the atomic clock Spencer, uh, experiment by Dr. Eberly Spencer. She wrote the people from the atomic clock experiment where they put a, they kept atomic clock on the ground, identical clock and an identical clock on the plane, as identical as things can be. And then they flew it around the world one way and flew it around the rest the other way. And they then compared the clocks and they claimed that uh, time dilation exists. And of course, every university on the planet um, oh, yeah, this is a picture of our opening night. There's my dad. It says, Einstein wrong. Um, there we go. And uh, we um, uh, basically, uh, she got the raw data. Now, listen, to, this is why she could find out that it was wrong. The people who were, ran the experiment at the time in 2000, in the early 2000s, were very old. They're in their 80s. And of course, by that time, you know, they were very famous for that experiment. Well, um, they didn't, they never put out the raw data. Because if you put out the raw data, then you have um, people's ability to dispute uh, what your claims were that it, in fact, um, uh, uh, it supported general relativity. And so, uh, I mean, special relativity. So what happened is she wrote them or contacted them. And what did they do? They sent her the raw data. No, no, you don't do that because that means your interpretation can be disputed. And that's what she did. What did she find out? Um, in the movie, it's really, really funny. She found out that in order for them to um, make the experiment uh, show general relativity uh, correct, that they had to have the experiment start 23 hours before the experiment started. I'm going to say that again. 
they had to make the experiment start 23 hours before the experiment actually started. And in the film, it's really funny. I, I love Dr. Eberle. She's got her PhD in mathematics in the 1940s. Woman, get that, right? Brilliant scientist. And she says, the speed of, two of the things she says in the film is speed of relativity, a speed of light is not constant, and Maxwell's equations aren't correct. So anyways, she's talking and she goes, so she's talking to my mom and I said, look, you're going to have to, you know, make this understandable to the average person who likes science. And so she did. And she goes, well, what they said, their conclusion was, well, the atomic clocks must have been excited and knew they were going on a trip. We're going on a trip. Literally, that was her answer. That was the way she could explain it to the average person. It's true. Well, that's a perfect exam uh, way to explain what they really did with the data in order to, to show relativity, special relativity, or general, special, <laughs> special relativity. This is time dilation. Sorry, Dave, I get it mixed up and I apologize. But special relativity, um, uh, in, uh, uh, correct, is that they had to show those clocks starting at a different speed. Anyways, it's in the movie. You should check it out. Um, then there's also Dr. Edward Dowdy, who I interview, we interviewed. I was down in San Diego. He's at a conference at that time. Um, he happened to be on the West Coast. So we, my mother and I met him. Got, I had a, a crew, a person on the crew film, helping film. And uh, he talks about uh, general relativity and how that light does, in fact, bend, uh, gravity uh, uh, doesn't, in fact, bend light. It's the coronas of sun that bends light. So um, it's, it's not a direct relationship between uh, electromagnetic radiation and and the force of gravity. So um, he talks about that. Um, I won't go too much into it. See the movie. Um, and then, of course, the big, big one was I couldn't believe is Stanford Linear Accelerator. Um, I think it's an interesting story there. Um, I had set up during the 2005 year. Everybody was going nuts. People were going to Stanford Linear Accelerator left, left and right because of the miracle year, 100-year miracle year of, of Einstein and all the nerds were nerding out because people, um, what was it? PBS was there to shoot the, the Einstein documentary who was being directed, the Einstein was being directory was uh, being directed by a friend of James Cameron, who, of course, directed the uh, uh, um, Avatar. Uh, you know, he's one of the great trades. He's a billionaire. Uh, and uh, Titanic um, and the uh, um, Terminator movies. So it was just big. Everybody in Hollywood wanted to be, oh, I want to hook up with the great minds of science, and I want to uh, be part of this Einstein thing. So um, uh, I called him up in five, and there was a guy from Australia, or or he had an uh, English accent, could have been Australia, could have been South Africa, somewhere, wasn't English, but he said, oh yeah, you can visit. So I was just another one of a film crew showing up at Stanford, their accelerator. So I called up and he said, okay, I told, gave him a time frame where I was gonna drive up my father, myself and my mom. And uh, we were gonna crew it. My dad was, does, I've got, I got film of my dad walking outside with the boom mic, stuff like that. Anyways, um, so I call him, I call them like a week before we're coming. Um, we drove up there, so we didn't have plane tickets. You know, we had hotel and all that stuff. And it turns out that um, I called them up, uh, or they called me. Can't remember. I think they called me like five days before. Yeah, they called me. And I hear the same guy, and his voice is trembling. I'm not lying. I'm not making it up like I, I'm making it dramatic. His voice was trembling. He was like, because uh, I think maybe he thought I was actually somebody like, big in the film industry and he was worried that he's going to blow it with somebody who may be important. I, no, I'm nobody. So um, he's, uh, well, Dave, you know, um, uh, about that coming to film, because we're going to film inside the Stanford Linear Accelerator and they had a physicist lined up to talk with us. So we've been, uh, it's been decided at the Stanford Linear Accelerated Community that it's not in the best interest of our community to let you film with inside the accelerator. And I was already prepared that maybe that could happen. I already had a Michael Moore moment. In fact, one of my old um, uh, um, trailers for the movie has my mom standing outside and the guards are watching us like, you know, these guys are filming. We had right, we were on public uh, property filming and so it was one of those Michael Moore moments. Um, I did that, but um, believe it or not, I said, okay, I guess then the 
physicist or the, uh, in fact, the experimentalist is better to put, said he would be, I said, I, I must, I'm imagining he doesn't want to inter, uh, be interviewed at all. And he goes, no, um, for some reason, he said he'd still want to be interviewed. I said, oh, I can interview him. I said, he said, yeah, I said, okay, I'll interview him. So I couldn't believe it. Um, I got in contact with him. I told him the time and, and place. We went there and I said, is there a place we can stand on a hill and overlook the accelerator? And he goes, yeah. So I do that. And so I'm up like, on, we, we traipse up my hill. My mom's got rheumatoid arthritis. It's not easy. So we're traipsing up in the hot sun in California, up the hill and down in the in the down below, you can see the accelerated cars going by in the highway in front of us. And he stands there and he tells me two things. He tells me, well, he tells me, but he tells my mom. So I would ask him questions. Have, I would tell my mom to, here's a question <laughs> and give the answer. So um, she did it. So she would give him the question and he gave the answer. And so he says, well, what do you think about special relativity? And so what does he say? Well, we have to un I have to unteach it to my grad students. I'm going to say that again. This is an experimentalist at the Stanford Linear Accelerator saying he has to unteach special relativity, the same special relativity that Bill Nye, the science guy, holds up with his phone and says, GPS only doesn't work without special relativity. He says we have to unteach it. And now the bigger one, which I knew from Dr. Karazani, and I didn't know if he would reveal this. And that was, they don't observe mass increase in particle accelerators. Special relativity says, as you get close to the speed of light, time slows down, length contracts, you get squashed, and then um, uh, mass increases. And he says, no, we do not measure mass increase uh, in, in particle accelerators. Right before the, the actual interview, before we went up on the hill and we talked with him, I, I pre-interview all the people in the film. I'll, I'll sit down with them. I bought them breakfast and I talk with them. And I first thing I said, so what's it like to be a theoretical physicist? He stopped eating, looked at me and gave me dagger eyes and says, don't ever accuse me of being a, 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 a theoretical physicist. I'm an experimental physicist. We do real things. <laughs> So I could tell they're the chip on the shoulder, but that was quite amazing. So you want to check it out. It's part of the Einstein uh, wrong, the miracle year. It's a great story. If you don't even like science, it's got a great story. I had I had uh, part of my budget for people who helped me with the story. The story is great. It follows my family. Uh, my dad and I do an experiment and along with um, a friend of ours and um and we have some miracles that happen in the film um and it's really a wonderful story uh, everybody who sees it they all come back and goes wow that's a great film I got it. Yeah. they go you could be a filmmaker i said um what were you watching uh a youtube video it was a film so i'm just saying take a take a what <clears throat> take a look at it it's a really great film great human story human uh, drama as well with our family it just happened to all come together really great so I want to check that out um so um one of the questions would be is why do we continue if einstein's wrong why do we continue to hear about him why is he constantly pushed why is he the most famous physicist um i didn't put down one other thing here i should have put down and that's his image i'll talk hopefully i'll remember that but why, why, is, why is that? Why is he continuing to be pushed even though we don't use it? It doesn't work. Um, well, there's a couple reasons. This is one reason, money. The other me reason I think a lot of us know, I should have put it there, but it's his hair. He, you know, I, Einstein was the progenitor, was the person who was the model for what we became to know as the mad scientist. Just look at Back to the Future and the professor in there. Just look at uh, Machu Kiku, uh, the science evangelist, looks just like Einstein. Look at all the people who are, are like on kids' channels or on cartoons or whatever. They always put in the funny Einstein hair. He became what Carmen Miranda became. Carmen Miranda is a Brazilian bombshell who happened to be born in Portugal, but who cares, right? Eh. 
and uh, um, she became the symbol. So you put fruit on your hair, you know who you are. You put a funny wig on for Halloween, you know who you are. Everyone knows who you are. So that whole thing of a crazy scientist working in his lab, coming up with brilliant things about the universe, that is just stuck into our human psyche. So um, that's one slide I didn't make. I'm sorry about that. But the other one is usually other things, you know, that can only last so long, but it's the money. And here's the answer to the question why he's still around and why people still give him lip service and why people push him. Why? Because Einstein, before he died, willed his image and work to, the, to a university in Israel. And for decades, Einstein was the second, or sometimes first, depending on the year, most lucrative dead celebrity with 10, 10 million or, uh, a year or more being generated for the university. That's a lot of money. And you know, you're gonna wanna keep that, that money train going. So to give an example, again, I'm sorry for those who watch this channel, you probably heard these stories before, is the example is that Einstein um, image, again, if you wanted to use it, let, it's just his image, you would have to pay for it. So you have a commercial like this one. I'll, there's a story behind this one, Ideas Are Sexy too. This is GM, I think, believe it or not, who did this uh, graphic. But um, if you wanted to use his image, you had to pay. Well, Steven Spielberg is Jewish, Einstein was Jewish. Um, Steven Spielberg has a big, um, he has donated a lot to Jewish causes. Uh, and so he, he's a gajillionaire, he's a billionaire. And uh, basically he at the time says, okay, I want it in my movie AI, I don't know, it's 20 years ago now, I'm gonna use Einstein's, um, three seconds of Einstein's uh, image, meaning video, uh, movie of Einstein. So he has actually moving pictures of Einstein. I think he was talking about, I don't know, they, the idea was they're going back in time looking at the great scientists and they and pretended there were scientists after Einstein and put them up and then Einstein comes up. And that for that three seconds, um, Steven Spielberg paid over $600,000 to use three seconds of Einstein's image. Who gets the money? The University of Israel, uh, in University in Israel. Um, so that certainly, um, made a, a big difference. And of course, they're going to push it. Merchandising, uh, toys, bobbleheads, t-shirts, um, all of those things. And here I was making a documentary. I actually got in contact with the best documentary lawyer in Hollywood. Um, can't remember his name. Really great guy. And I went up to him. I would go to all the documentary galas and everything. Michael Moore was there. Uh, you know, uh, other people were there. Maybe, you know, Ken Burns. Um, you get people like, um, I saw Vice President Gore at the time with his, you know, his film too. So I go all these galas and I go around to people trying to, you know, get to the right people. So I talked with this guy. I found out he was the lawyer for documentarians because he worked on open access and, um, you know, open source information about that I can go and for instance, he defended people to be able to go and film uh, logos of big companies. So you can as a documentarian, thanks to a lot of people's work. Can't remember what the name of the, the cause is, but they work with that. It's a cause where they always fighting for rights. So I kept going up to him and I told him about the concept of the film and it's like, look, you know, Einstein's uh, images like, you know, um, uh, uh, it's got copyrights on it and I'm going to be using it all over the place. I'm going to be talking about his works and all that. And he goes, okay, let me look at it. And I go to the next event. You usually have a couple of year. Hey, how's it going? I think his name is Michael. And, uh, Hey, fine. Hey Dave. Oh yeah. I remember you. Oh, okay. Uh, what can you just, I, I'm on it. So I remember like the third time I, I go to him, he goes, I go up to him, hey, Michael, he goes, hey, Dave, how you going? So and so and so, blah, blah, blah. No one, people were staying away from me like the plague, though. They really were. Um, I talked to other people. I would not tell my movie because they'd all like sort of walk away. Um, you know, you had people with conspiracy movies that uh, that were a lot less believable than the idea that Einstein was wrong. But he, I go up to him and he's talking and uh, he's talking, he's uh, introducing me. He goes, use, use Einstein, use his image, do everything. Don't worry about it. And then he went back to his big schmoozing and talking and I went on because I'm the little guy. So I felt, okay, great. So it turns out that I see this in 2010. And I'm really getting close to the end of my um, 
it, does, it didn't happen in 2010, but happened really close to when I was about to release my film. And I still wasn't sure, even though people tell you, you're still not sure. Well, anyways, then I see this article with this picture in it, and it says, ideas are sexy too. Einstein with this buff body and equals seventy squared on his arm. Then they put a, somebody did a likeness of him to put on top of it. And of course, what happened, the University of Israel sued them. And this is a big corporation. It turns out that they were in the middle of suing them and the statute of limitations ran out. So the judge went to him and says, sorry, even if we, uh, they haven't really, I don't think they used it yet or they did. He says, um, we're going to throw this out because it's just no longer valid. And everybody decided it was in their best interest to drop it. And at that point I knew uh, what was going on, but I figured, all right, that's going to help because if Einstein is no longer able to make money off his image and his works, this is going to not going to have that impetus of money behind it. No, what happens? A, tw a, a, a person who's 26 now must have been really younger, a lot younger, ends up registering Facebook. That's well, over 10 years, right? So this kid was probably in his teens, ends up registering Albert Einstein on Facebook because he's dead. Everyone knows who Al and makes it look like this is Albert Einstein's Facebook page. F fast forward a few years, five years, he's now got 20 million followers, 20 million. All he's been doing is like, pushing and worshiping Einstein, pushing pictures and go to subscribe to it now. Well, it used to be 21 million. It's actually falling. It's been falling. It's actually losing subscribers now. It went up to a peak and now people are like going off. It's like, why is this even relevant? So they're there. And I, f I figured, well, this is not related to the Israel. So I look them up. I start doing some research a year or two ago. And what do I find? The currently 26 year old who I, I can't remember his name, um, but I know who he is. Someone wrote an article about this. And what did he do? He hooked up with the University of Israel. So universities Israel is Israel is still out there making money on because when you have a Facebook page with 20 million followers, it's not that it's important because you get a lot of people. Facebook pays you. Fake, like YouTube, Facebook gives you money because they're going to be able to advertise to an enormous amount of people. Then what happens? They put they put out the five years ago, maybe a PBS series or no, I don't think it was PBS. Some other um, network put out the um, there every five, 10 years. They put out the, the next Einstein um, movie, uh, whatever. And so it turns out that they do genius. And what happens? All of a sudden, the Facebook page of Einstein becomes genius. It becomes all the genius thing. The, the banner becomes genius. All of a sudden, there are contests about it. What's happening? You think they're getting on that Facebook page? It goes, hey, hey, 26 year old, just let us use it. You got this. Thanks so much. No, they paid probably millions of dollars to use that as a marketing campaign for Einstein. So that's why Einstein's so going. I think that's my last slide. Oh, no. Um, here we go. This is my last slide. Yep. Uh, questions, of course, is, is relativity relevant? We'll talk about that now. We've got about 45 minutes left. <clears throat> Should we try to convince mainstream Einstein is wrong? Um, but I'm going to talk to you about one more story. Do we worship Einstein? And um, here's a picture of Einstein, um, pretty much a humiliating kind of picture, in my opinion, of him with a Einstein doll. Um, and um, there, the person next to him that you see down there with a, a picture of, of Einstein, his name is Jack Rosenberg. I interviewed him a couple of times for the movie. Um, I didn't tell him the, the um, uh, title of the, the movie until the end. And then I get a call from him uh, after having this wonderful um, uh, uh, interview about a, an actual friend of Einstein's. He claimed to be the only true friend of Einstein's. I mean, a very close friend. He was. He would go to Einstein's house every couple months, he and his wife, and they would sit and they'd have chats and stuff. But um, he was his friend. And um, um, this guy was the epitome of seeing a person getting into the fame and worship of what who Einstein was. I would get calls from him before he said no to the film. I would get um, 
calls from him literally like at 12 30 one o'clock in the morning i'd be getting a call from him because i went to interview him he was all excited because you know his claim to fame he was a an electrical engineer he met einstein because he was an electrical engineer at princeton and uh, rosenberg for einstein's 70th birthday wanted to do something special he had heard uh, jack rosenberg was making an fm transmitter and jack rosenberg um, showed the transmitter and the, the clarity of FM at the time was sounded like digital to us now. And there was only there was one radio station in New York City broadcasting. They could pick it up. So he said, OK, Rosenberg, can you set up um, a FM receiver for Einstein? I want to give him a president uh, present at his 70th birthday. Well, it turns out that Einstein was very famous. Einstein himself, Rosenberg said, didn't understand his fame. And he said Rosenberg also said everyone around him didn't. He in Rosenberg, not in Rosenberg's opinion, because he was worshiping Einstein by the time I talked with him. He uh, said that all the other all the other people like Oppenheimer. I mean, this is Oppenheimer, right? This is not a small person. Um, in the, in science, and he said, none of, nobody nobody at Princeton could understand uh, Einstein's fame, and and I'm and 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 Rosenberg said, you know, even Einstein was puzzled by it, but he was super famous, you know, the guy who said gravity and light changes, I mean, gravity bends light and time changes, and you know that kind of thing really in the crazy scientist thing. So he was just it was really a popularity, famous popularity, it had nothing to do with science really. So um, I get calls in the middle of the night, and, I, and I, go, he, I, I said, who's calling? And it's Jack Rosenberg. And I go, okay, Jack, what's, how's it going? Yeah. Um, I said, what do you, is there something wrong, or why are you calling? I said, oh, I forgot to tell you in the interview, um, Einstein's a favorite musician. And I said, okay. Um, he said, oh, yeah, Einstein told me his favorite musician was Mozart. And I go, okay. He goes, okay, that's all I wanted to say. Click. I'm going, what's going on here? And I could, you know, then I get a phone call months, a month later, you know, within a span of weeks, I, I think. And I get another phone call late at night. And he goes, this is Jack. I go, oh, hi, Jack. How you doing? Um, he says, have you sent me the, um, um, uh, the, um, release form said not yet Jack. <laughs> so i didn't want to send it to him but i didn't send him so i he said no i didn't oh i forgot to tell you one other thing he goes he says you know what who's the funniest man in the world uh i go no he says um uh groucho marx and i says well why is he the funniest man he goes well einstein said and so i hung up the I, you know hung up the phone again and i thought to myself Here's a guy whose all his fame is because he knew Einstein. The fame really doesn't mean anything. If you ask him probably about the theory of relativity, he really knew nothing. He doesn't even know probably about Brown, uh, about, uh, maybe he did a little bit, but he was an electrical engineer. And um, uh, he was just worshiped him. He just, I mean, it was really amazing, but he had amazing stories. He would talk, he talked to Einstein about dropping the atomic bomb. I mean, these were amazing stories. He he said that Einstein, he would sit there and he'd talk. Many of his talks involved him telling Einstein not to feel guilty about the bomb. It wasn't his fault. He, was, he said, you know, of course it wasn't because Einstein was convinced himself because of E equals MC squared that he had some relation to the bomb. There was zero relationship to the bomb. If you go to the, re the good website, there wasn't. So it was just a fame of having relationship and then guilt on Einstein's part of that. It's just, it's crazy. But do we worship him? Yes. And when I go on Einstein, I am a, I'm proud to say I am a top fan of the Einstein webpage. I know who the pseudonames of the people um, for Einstein webpage are. Um, I know exactly the two names they use because they come at me and anything I put down, I could pay, put the sky is blue and they'll have a laughing emoji on me. They'll laugh at me, right? But I use it a lot. I get a lot of people in this direction actually because of that. But anyways, uh, I'm gonna open this up now to discussion. I know we have people in the green room. Here's, here's what I think we have to discuss how much do we you know is it relevant is relativity even relevant to our work do we waste time on it do we not waste time on it we have so many people who have spent and i know a lot of people here who have spent time to look at relativity themselves and and say okay um 
here's where he's wrong and I want to write a paper on it. I want to let other people know about it. Um, where do we stand today? Are we wasting our time? We know very well from history that no, no one in mainstream changes their mind. It just doesn't happen. Everybody, and even Einstein, people disputed Einstein until he was dead. There were people like um, Dingle and other people, um, even um, Mickelson and Morley. You know, so it's not that mainstream changes. So what, what do we what do we do? Do we, do we continue to try to convince others he is wrong? Um, how do we do that? I'm just really open up the discussion. Now, if you have a question or comment in the chat, um, let me put that up there, um, banners. You can just say, da, 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 here we go, put that up there. You can just say, uh, uh, put a question or comment there. I'll bring it up, but I have people in the um, green room, I'm sure, who want to, I would be willing to talk and let me, uh, again, I wanted to get at least sort of a background for this. And we got 40 minutes to talk about this and uh, people in the green room, raise your hand and I will bring you up if you want to say something. And uh, my paid person in the audience, oh, I have another, two people. <laughs> no, uh, I'm going to bring up Dan Dennis Allen there. Let's hopefully we got everybody's uh, speakers and everything working. So let's bring up uh, uh, Dennis Allen. Do you have uh, your speakers working? I'm not hearing you. You're, you're... Anybody else hearing him? No. Okay. I got it. Okay. So once you work on that, I'm going to bring you down. I'm going to bring up um, one of the... Uh, I'm going to make you a co-host. You know that. How are you, Ian? How are you? Oh, hello. Very well. Thank you, David. Um, yeah, I was I wasn't accusing sure you. If you're referring to me as the page. Yeah, no, no. I said I'm going to make you a co-host. So, uh, oh, yes. I mean, you're always here. But no, no, it's it's interesting. I think it's, you know, this sort of hit me this week because I didn't have anybody lined up. You know, I constantly try to line up people and, you know, some weeks we don't have it. And I thought, what could we talk about? And I thought, you know, we, we've spent decades showing Einstein wrong. You know, what it's what relevancy does it have today? Um, and that, that's a big question. It, the relevancy could come from us showing people that science can be wrong and that huge people that we look up to can be wrong. It could be totally irrelevant. And we should just go on from it. I mean, what, what, what's your take on, on this? Well, I, I have a couple of comments, perhaps, um, which, which may lead to that, David. Um, first, um, I, I've I've always spoken um, against the propensity to use the term relativity when one really means Einsteinian relativity. Now, um, in a way, for conciseness, I suppose you've done that in the title of the talk today, but not in the substance. So, you know, that, that's yeah. obviously forgivable. Uh, but, I mean, I'm a relativist in the sense that I accept the basics of Galilean relativity but I, I don't accept Einsteinian relativity. So, so that was the first comment I, th I thought I'd make. Um, we, we've sort of arrogated, you know, the, this term relativity is, is synonymous with Einstein. And of course, that to a certain extent is indicative of the very points that were being made about his sort of famous nature uh, and that we, we would associate uh, his name with, with this one word, which really is a more generic term. Um, now the the other thing is is um you know you 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 talked about the the fame there and <clears throat> you know the sort of shakespeare's um uh, some men are born great some men achieve greatness and some men have greatness thrust upon them now i think probably in the area that we're looking at it's it's the last of those that we talk about men having greatness thrust upon them and by greatness here i mean notoriety and, and knowledge uh, on the part of the sure. public so einstein is obviously a prime example of that but but so are people like stephen hawking um and, and others w which the public could could name very quickly but i mean they couldn't name lorenz uh, or poincare or hilbert uh, you know who, who did a lot of the grand work which i suppose or even planck actually uh, that, that einstein later took and, and, and built his own theories upon or maybe maybe even took the same ideas so um you know 
Einstein was not superhuman in that he could plan all this himself. He obviously had a certain capacity uh, uh, in in promulgating information or in assembling information, whether it was plagiarized to a certain extent or whether it was sort of a strange way of looking at things. But I mean, he did move from being a patent agent to you know a professor and a, a, a well-known uh, science. Uh, person who you know ultimately ended up in the princeton institute for advanced studies and i i, I put that down to other people pushing him into that position for sort of quite like political reasons the 1919 eclipse uh, expedition would be a, a prime example of that um so um I, I, I really don't know. I mean, you mentioned earlier on, I think, about this, um, or maybe it was in the chat, something about, yeah, it's all very well. I think somebody said it in the comment. It's all very well criticizing it, but but what's the alternative or something like that, or what's your theory? That That's something which frequently um, is put to people who yes. criticize this. And, you know, it, it, it's not put in regard to other theories which are sort of tenuous or provisional this is like dogma it's almost like yeah. the bible if you don't believe in the bible what are you going to replace it with you know if you don't yeah. believe in einstein's srt GRT, what are you going to replace it with so um you know I, I i think we're contributing certainly to the debate but i must confess that i'm not sure if it's really leading anywhere not not rapidly anyway and that's the question you're really posing and i, I don't know if i have an answer to it i mean one must plod on and try to um, show how um, using, you know, a, a true scientific method, one really ought to have some doubts about <clears throat> the received wisdom. And also, uh, one, one really has to have doubts about those who have been put into prime positions by greatness being thrust upon them, you know, as, as, as was mentioned earlier. Um, <clears throat> right, right. I think I think an interesting point that I hear a lot too, and I heard a lot is I heard it when I was making the movie. Um, people said, "Okay, well, Einstein's wrong because it's a title, right? Who's right, right?" And and I think you know the problem is I would say to people, I said, "Why do you have to replace something that's wrong? If I tell you that one plus one is is equal to three and it's wrong, why do I need to replace it? What, what's there?" I said, isn't there, is, aren't there cases in, in, in science where it's a dead end? Look at evolution, right? Evolution, something isn't working, it dies out. It's not that you, you know, oh, who's, who's going to replace the Neanderthals, right? It's, it's one of those things where I think what they, what they people also say is uh, it's more of a fame thing as well because people want to say, this is a person who's famous. This is a theory that we have. Who's going to take their place? Or are you the next, you know, oh, you just want to take his place? Or are you people who are criticizing Einstein? You just want to be famous. That's what I got mostly from people who were scientists or physicists who said that they subscribe to relativity. They go, oh, you just want to show it wrong so you can be famous. Now, now, if you think about it, I would come right back at him and says, oh, I see. It's not truth that we're looking for. It's fame. And they would get so mad. I mean, they, you know, but uh, it is true. People want, they think, well, we have to replace it. And my question, my question back is, okay, what is it that we're replacing? Right? What is it? If, so, if, if you know, that's a good question that people ask, but that's, that's a question back at, okay, what are we replacing? Are we, we're pre replacing something that doesn't work. Like, let's say, okay, I come up with a new vehicle, right? And I think everybody's going to, get in this vehicle and drive I'm going to sell millions of them around the world and the thing doesn't work and somebody's going to come up to me and say so what are you going to do to replace it it's not there it's gone i i think that's probably the correct strategy uh when addressing people who have some knowledge of physics you know either either professional physicists or people who have some knowledge of it that probably is the right way to go about it and then one can get into mmx or you know other 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 aspects and seeing you know whether this is a real explanation or not but i mean for the for the public at large who who on their own admission know nothing about it and mm -hmm. you know they they uh, and i'm talking about educated people i'm not just talking about you know sure, uneducated sure. Maybe people in other areas they say how can, for the last um, 80 years or something, 
Um, all the greatest minds, all the greatest journalists, all the greatest politicians, all the, the greatest lawyers and courts of law and, and universities and what, how can they all be wrong? They, they say this is one of the greatest um, intellects that we've ever had. And the, uh, uh, you know, uh, as Sir Arthur Eddington uh, claimed, the general theory of relativity is probably one of the greatest, if not the greatest, contribution made by, by human thinking. H how can that be wrong? It's just completely out of their concept. Um, so that's why they attack you, because it's, it's like something which is so fundamental and um you know it would really require such a, a revolution uh, in in the acceptance of 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 you know received wisdom on all the parts of the authorities and the people they look up to doctors and lawyers and theologians and politicians and scientists they all agree on this and it doesn't matter where you are during the cold war <laughs> You could be in the Soviet Union or you could be in the United States of, of America, which were nearly at loggerheads, were at loggerheads with each other, nearly started to do But they both agreed on this. It doesn't matter what country you're in. You could be in a communist country. You could be in a capitalist country. This, this, this was accepted all over the world. It was received wisdom. Yeah. You know, I think another reason, one of the things that I thought a lot about, and I ended up writing an article on our website called Beyond, um, Beyond Mainstream, is I was really thinking about what really made Einstein and this mad scientist, what really created that? And I really thought to myself, fame, the fame that, when I talk with Joe's, uh, Jack Rosenberg, he, he, he said that, again, it, it was a huge puzzle as to why Einstein was so famous. And like you said, there's so many other people, so many scientists out there. If you look at it in a scientific sense, they are so much more than even Einstein. But what was it about Einstein that really caught the imagination? So I really, really, really thought about that. And my conclusion came from what made the public uh, uh, think it was fantastic was the implications of, of his relativity theory. People, uh, people do not, we do not today have a model for light. We do not today have a model for gravity among two things or for magnetism or even electricity we don't have a real physical model we can't and we don't sit i mean in a classroom if you're an electrical engineer you're told that the current is holes left behind uh by electrons moving in the opposite direction i mean it's, it's ridiculous right so we don't have these answers so here comes a scientist who says look um gravity and light interact and, and a curiosity we humans have is what is this stuff? It's just a natural, and we don't have any answers for it. So along comes a guy saying, well, I don't, you know, I'm not saying what it is, but what happens is gravity and light have this interaction. People got that. They understood it. And then all of a sudden in the 20th century where you had John Cage making silence making, being, um, music you had um people like freud who says nothing's real it's you know it's all in our head and we're all you know we were we were allowed you know and then in art we had duchamp going in and getting a urinal and putting it into a uh, and saying that's art we were being challenged by everything so when einstein came along and said time is is relative and mass increases and time well time slowed down and all these things those things captured the imagination people sort of grab you know grabbed onto that they can understand if you ask a person the idea that gravity bends light they'll get that more or less and i think and then everything's energy energy mass has an energy and it's got this one constant next to it and it's got this equation on it right e equals mc squared these things were simple so simple that the average person could get it and I think because of that, they latched on to him, they saw the crazy hair, and this whole thing was born. It was just a, a number of things that came together. So I don't think his fame necessarily even came from the pushing of it because of the, the Israeli university or anything. I just think people were fascinated by someone actually made an observation about two things that no one really knew about. And so at least, okay, we don't know what they are, but we know a relationship between them. You know, that that's that was one of the things I, I thought about with that. The other question, the thing you mentioned is, is rel, uh, I didn't address, is relativity relevant? Well, that was the discussion part. <laughs> that was on purpose. What I wanted to do is give everybody sort of a background. But um, 
Okay, uh, let's see if we have some more more people. Did you have any more other comments? If you no, do, thank, I'll bring you. Back. thank you. We, we still have like 20 minutes left, so we'll see here. Okay, I'm going to try somebody else here. Um, we do have some comments. I'll be looking through the chat. Uh, if you do have comments and you've got questions or comments there, we'll take a look at it. I'm going to try um, Dennis. Are you available there again? Hello? No, we still don't hear you. Okay, so you want to check your computer most uh, if I were to sit at your computer, I would most likely find that even though you have it chosen through the browser and the cam mic settings that most likely your computer setting is wrong. It's not the browser setting. It's probably the computer mic. So I'll take you back down. Anybody in the green room wants to speak, please wave their hand. Oh, Harry Ricker. Well, of course. Hello, Harry. How are you? Good morning, David. Um, this is an interesting uh, video, and I particularly like the Karazani discussion. Um, first, I heard a lot of things. I didn't know your connection to Karazani, and I would like to comment on one of the things that you said, and I have a few other comments. Sure, absolutely. Go ahead. The floor is yours. Um, I think the issue is that everybody's got an opinion about why Einstein's wrong and why relativity is wrong. But what I did was I looked through it and I there's a common denominator and one of the common denominators you mentioned in what Karazani says. And he said that you can only have one three-dimensional system. That's what you said as I understand it. Is that correct yes, or not? Absolutely. Correct? It took me three years to understand his equation, but that's exactly what he said. Yeah. Okay. Um, what I I worked on this for many years, as you know, when I was a, right. in the uh, NPA relativity uh, moderator in that discussion group. And what I learned in studying um, all the different papers, a lot of different opinions, is there is one common denominator. And what you said about Karazani's work is the common denominator. So when you get down to it, that's the mathematical fall. You cannot have more than one frame of reference. Yes. Okay, yes. that's the flaw. It's a mathematical flaw. It violates the uh, unique identity element theorem of algebra because it violates this identity element theorem in algebra. The Lorentz transformations don't work correctly. So the mathematics mm -hmm. doesn't work. It's not consistent. It's not correct. And what happens is over a period of years, everybody keeps rediscovering this, okay? But they get ignored, okay? And the physics establishment doesn't really get the message that there is a flaw in relativity and that's the relativity postulate is wrong. You cannot have speed of light be the same in more than one frame of reference if the frames are in relative motion. Yes. There's only yes. one frame of reference. Yes. That's the problem, that's the flaw. And if you look at all the different people who have written about relativity, they find the mathematics is wrong, but they try, they give different reasons. Some of them give the same reason, okay? The common thread is the relativity principle doesn't work in the mathematics. Right, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, we're not getting the word out about that. Yep. Yep. Okay. Now, the to the issue of you have to have a replacement theory. That's a catch-22 because uh, they're not going to accept any replacement right. theory because Einstein's theory is correct. So you have to prove Einstein's theory is wrong before they will consider a need for a replacement theory, but they won't consider a need for a replacement theory because they say Einstein's theory is correct. Yes. So it's yeah. a catch-22, yeah. you can't solve that. Yeah, it's very similar to the mechanism for expansion tectonics. They say, we won't accept expansion tectonics until you have a mechanism. And uh, they use that as a, a way never to go forward with that. But yeah, I, I agree. Um, uh, I think what you're saying is, is it was interesting because Karazani's work, when he did take the frame away, 
the equations that he come up with came up with were just movement equations. Basically, it's saying if you have a single body in space and it wants to move, it's got to move by by eliminating mass. And that's what that, instead of that relative movement causing mass to increase, which is just crazy, which comes from the extra frames. When you remove that, you can use the you just have autodynamic what he called autodynamic equation. And then he applied his autodynamic equations to um, particle collisions in in particle accelerators and ended up explaining the exact same thing without the neutrino and the neutrino ends up being um, the uh, bastard child of applying special relativity to radioactivity that's what he found that was what it was so it's really is interesting and i agree i agree with you 100 percent. this idea that we have to replace einstein's theory is just a is absolutely a catch-22. It's like politicians saying, well, we'd like to solve that problem, but it's too complicated and you don't know. And we're just, you know, it just can't be done that way. It's just, it's just sort of an excuse. Um, the other thing too, I think interesting, Harry, is that so many people within the community don't use it. They've almost pushed, you know, you were talking about why we can't get the information out. I've noticed, and I've talked with even Unsker in private conversations about this. He says, they just, Special relativity has been put away like a um, an old movie camera that no one can use anymore and doesn't serve a purpose and is it, it really doesn't work. And they're all looking at general relativity now, you know, to find planets and all that stuff. That's one of the things, even at Stanford Linear Accelerator, when I talked to the guy uh, who said we don't observe, we have to unteach special relativity, you know. Um, well, that's they, what Broad Hatch found with GPS. Yeah. Um, but the point is, um, yeah, we know that they're not really using special relativity. They still keep teaching it in the textbook. So what that does is that creates a lot of people wasting their time sure. uh, trying yeah. to figure out why the equations of special relativity don't work exactly right. You know, there's a lot of contradictions and problems. And so, um, you know, I get papers, you know, every couple of months from somebody who says, you know, I proved right. Einstein's special relativity incorrect. <laughs> There's so many people who have done it, it's kind of, um, you know, um, uh, recently I got a paper from uh, Vidat Batu, I think that would recall his name, well, yeah, I don't yeah, know if yeah, he's yeah, listening, yeah, yeah. I know he and he's got a whole complete book, okay, it goes on and on and on, and he proves special relativity is wrong and general relativity is wrong. And, um, you know, and a lot of the work is repeating or reinventing the wheel, if you will, of other people who have who basically have shown the same thing. You know, he shows the same thing that I came to uh, that I discovered and published a paper in uh, 2011. And that's at the General Science Journal, the GSJ, the General Science Journal. Sure. And, um you know, and um, Stephen Crothers um, has this proof that essentially is the same proof that I, it's not mathematically the same. It's a completely different proof uh, mathematically, and its reasoning is based on different principles. He comes to the same conclusion that I did in my 2011 paper. That's in uh, Vidat's book, and uh, you can go online and, and look up Stephen Crothers' paper. Um, but even myself and Stephen Crothers were, you know, the proof existed before we did our proofs. So the, the information's out there, it's been done before. Um, and, but you know, the, the, uh, you know, somebody comes along and says, well, this proof is wrong, you know, and then people ignore it and don't really pay attention to it. And people like me that go back and read all the papers, you know, starting in, I, you know, with the book that was written by Henry Bergson and uh, what was it, 1921 or 22, right. you know, he shows that special relativity is wrong. And a book that was published in the 1920s, early 1920s, well, the physicist all came out and said, no, that's wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. No, he was right. <laughs> okay. And so because they made this fundamental mistake of you know, this assumption of the principle of relativity, which leads to faulty mathematics. Right. The mathematics right. is faulty if you use that assumption. So you can't have good mathematics in special relativity and special relativity is the foundation of general relativity. So you can't have good mathematics in general relativity. 
So basically, people are going to continue to find mistakes in the mathematics everywhere. Right. OK, right. well, what can the science establishment do but say, oh, we have to ignore this because it's an embarrassment. OK, yeah. that's a problem yeah. for them because it's yeah. an embarrassment. Yeah. OK, yeah. so yeah. they continue to use to say, you know, all published in textbooks, mathematically defective you know, scientific theories. And people continue to look at these theories and say they're mathematically defective. Yeah. OK, that's been happening for over 100 years. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think I think what's going to happen is two, one of two things happens when there's a shift. Either enough people discover that or somebody al comes along who has clout in the world of physics that will finally say, no, enough is enough. We have to go on. This is flawed. Here's why. And then people accept it sort of like in Eddington. Uh, but I, I'll give you some examples of it's not always taught and I and recently I do get in people get in contact with me who are physics teachers uh, uh, high school teachers university professors um, and they tell me uh, for instance in my film I uh, filmed in a class an advanced physics class a lot of these people are going into theoretical physics a lot of them uh, and uh, it turns out I said oh uh, show me the chapter in the book on relativity he goes oh we, we it's 46 pages but we don't teach that they don't teach it. So one of the things we think that they teach, they don't teach. And so it's even worse. They're not a lot of the places aren't even teaching it. There's all that lip service about it. But I think slowly but surely it's being chipped away at. I mean, I think eventually something will happen. Either enough people will see this that people will be brave enough to start, you know, talking about it in their classroom or whatever and not get uh, called out by their kid, their students. One of my friends, Louise, who presented a number of times at the MPA, he uh, was teaching people in his class to show both sides of the Big Bang, relativity, particle physics, etc. And uh, his students literally went to the deans and called him out and said he's teaching, you know, heresy. So but OK, um, any other comments before I uh, well, there's lots of comments. I put in yeah. the chat um, this new book that's come out by Vidot. I mean, okay. he's, you know, and the, kind of the point, I, I don't know that everybody can see that. I don't know if you can see it. I, um, I look at it you know, that, it's a pretty long piece of work, and it's mostly mathematics. And he says the mathematics is wrong. Well, you know, I think Karazani, you know, um, kind of discovered that. You know, I know that... Um, um, uh, Carl Zaffe, I published some stuff about Carl Zaffe on the General Science Journal. Um, he did, he he came to this conclusion, uh, I forget exactly when, what well, was in the 1970s. I mean, that's a similar story to the Karazani story. He wrote letters to NASA proposing these experiments to, you know, prove relativity wrong. They ignored him, of course. Um, you know, um, there's Herbert Ives in the 1920s, late 1920s, uh, looked into this whole business of relativity and uh, published a, a series of papers in um, optics journals, not physics journals, but optics journals, I think. Right, right. And there's a book, The Einstein Myth, where that uh, by Dean Turner, where he talks about Ives. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Ives did this Ives Stillwell experiment to prove that relativity was wrong, special relativity, and that the ether existed. And um, the mainstream did a very brilliant thing was they claimed his experiment proved that special relativity was correct. You know, that's really <laughs> ironic. You know, this yeah. guy who yeah. published all these papers saying that it was wrong, they, they co-opted his experiment and said it was correct. Well, that might have happened to your experiment with Terrazani if they'd done it. So, um, you know, it, th this is, uh, I, I think the real point is basically is you have to start with correct mathematics and the people who are saying that the mathematics is wrong aren't wrong. And um, that, that's really the key. Um, I noticed that the paper that I uh, did on um, uh, the light sphere paradox isn't at the beyond mainstream science site. So it's really unavailable right now. Yeah, so I'm working on that. I got a call from um, a cat on that yesterday. Literally, I was in the hospital with my dad and and, and I. All right. Well, I understand. Him. I understand that issue. OK, you know, yeah. I appreciate that. So, you know, as long as we, um, you know, people have some questions about that. 
but you know this this issue is not it's not it's really a lot of people that's the whole point it's really a lot of people um you know and people are getting hung up on this you know einstein's relativity the mathematics doesn't work you know so it's hard to convince people to believe in science when they can do mathematics and we're not talking about you know really super brilliant mathemat mathematicians you know where people can do basic logic basic equations and mathematics and you know come to the conclusion that it's wrong i mean that's that's yeah. really yeah. embarrassing to people who say we're scientists and we're brilliant and we know everything and what we say is true yeah well listen thank you harry i'm going to bring you down uh and i appreciate your comments uh you should check that out yeah and i will go uh harry has a bunch of articles on our website i did notice there was a problem with that i will get to that it's on my list of things to do harry is a brilliant writer if you haven't read his his work uh, I would highly recommend going to beyond uh, beyond mainstream.org. Take a look at those articles. I even put, I think, a, one of them on our natural philosophy website. One of the long list of things I need to do, but I will definitely do that. I really, really enjoy his writing, and I know a lot other people do too. Um, if anybody else in the green room has a quick comment, I can uh, get to them. Um, I know a lot of people have been making comments about uh this i've been looking through i did put um harry just so you know i did put in the chat the link to um um i think but book so i did copy and paste that from the private link to the public link so you have that um so anybody else want to come up i know i see some people in the green room raving i think jim Mar uh marison i'll bring you up i've only got about a few minutes here um so hello yeah. <clears throat> Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, quick comment that your um, question was, is, is uh, relativity still re relevant? Is that it's holding back progress in physics. Yeah. Because any physicist who has to, wants to propose an, an alternative or new idea has to account for relativity or it's, it's rejected. Right. That's a good point. So it's still very relevant in that in that sense. Right. It is. It is. That's one of the things. It's like you said. I think you said the eight hundred pound gorilla, in in the room. You have the Michael. <laughs> that was the Michael Mor Morrison experiments, but uh, absolutely. And right. that's what and, led to. Uh, that, and that's what led to relativity, and that's what relativists will always fall back on and say. Yes. That's why it's right. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. That is a great point. Also, the way I look at it, too, is if you look at new models, my father and I have a model we literally just put in the book. The only thing we put in the book about relativity is uh, it, it's not part of uh, the universe. It's just not. And, it's I, the, and I have an answer to this, to, to, the, to the null results of Michael Zamorley, and that's well, to then do what it you in need outer to space. Do. What you want to do is, um, if you, why don't you come on and we'll talk about it, okay? Uh, let's okay. set up a time and uh, be glad to have us talk about it. Michael Zamorley and is... I, uh, and, and, and I'd like to promote an alternative uh, theory that's been, been very well de developed called the local ether model, uh, developed sure. by uh, Professor Ching Chuan Su. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Then uh, you prepare it and let's talk. Um, we are. I'm I have a paper people. on ResearchGate. You can look at. Okay. So we'll talk offline about that. But thanks for your comments. You're right. It does hold back. I mean, that's one of the big things. It's holding back science, I think, a lot. It's so, like, look, I like to call it uh, Albert in Wonderland. <laughs> Very good. I like that. Albert in Wonderland. Very good. We've gone down a rabbit hole I and mean, keep digging deeper yeah. and deeper every day. Yeah. And, and people don't, it's so bizarre because people don't use it. People know it's wrong. People in university know it's wrong. I've talked with professors in physics. I, I talked with, a, I, I had a communication with a professor saying, um, literally, he says, I tell my students when I teach Quantum, quantum mechanics that I don't believe almost any of it, but I've got to teach it. <laughs> there you go. So science is a real mess, but I uh, thank you very much for your comment and we'll look forward. I'm glad you came on. Uh, let's do a, a session and talk about what you found in that and that ether theory, local ether theory. I'd love to hear about it. I'm ready. Let's go. Okay. That sounds great. That's really good. Well, listen, um, I figured we'd have a ton of people um, interested in this. Um, I am going to end on time today, maybe even a few minutes early. Uh, I do appreciate all the comments in the uh, um, the chat. I'm sorry I didn't get to them all today. I want, wanted really more to present and talk. Again, if you do want to come online and talk with us, you can get to us by going to the um, 
this this link is ma made every week to go to this particular um, live in um, StreamYard, which is through a browser. All we ask is if you have a camera and at least a decent setup so we don't get feedback. And uh, you can join in at any time in any of our discussions on live. But uh, I am going to be going out a few minutes early today. Um, and again, I apologize to everybody in the comments section. Uh, I do really appreciate everybody coming by. And uh, next week we'll have another great week. Um, and for those who just came in, this is recorded and you can take a look at it. Uh, questions? Uh, let's see here. Dave, please check your email expanding. Your, uh, yes, I will do that. Um, again, if you are in the chat, and you want to put question or comment. I, that's the easiest way for me to see something. Um, I am looking back, but I'm not seeing a whole bunch. But like I said, I need to get going. So let's take it out as we normally do. Remember what I always say, stay think, stay critical, stay thinking. I'm Dave D. Hilster. I'm your science therapist trying to get us get you all to the promise line of just becoming a critical thinker. Don't believe me. Check it out yourself. Think, make your own decisions. Ciao for now.